Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on multi-scale assessment on the quality of metal powder feedstock for additive manufacturing. My name is Rena Samsu, marketing at Eurofins EAG Laboratories. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items for today's event. All attendees have been muted. However, we'd still love to hear from you during today's presentation. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions panel located in the bottom right of your screen. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. Pat McEwen, one of our specialists, along with a few of our other technical experts, will be answering some of the questions during the presentation, and we will also collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's talk. At the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up on your screen. Your feedback is greatly appreciated and will help us to improve our future events. I would now like to introduce our presenter, Shinwei Wang, Project Manager at Eurofins EAG Laboratories. Hello, everyone. Um, today, our topic, as Rina said, is going to deal with the multiple concepts. And uh, our idea is to oh, going over some of the quality issue with the metal powder filter stocks used for energy manufacturing. And we will take advantage of EAG's uh, multi-technique uh, uh, combinations, so we can deal with the multi-lens scale, multi-chemistry scales, and uh, surface bulk uh, informations. So my name is Xinwei. As you can see here, I have uh, my most uh, experience is in material science and engineering. I joined the EAG 12 years ago, mostly focused on third-party material testing, and I'm currently with a primary focus on technical consultation and the project management. And uh, along with me, our colleagues, Jim Gibson, he's a top Teams S specialist, and Pat McCain, he's an OJ specialist, and uh, Sasha Rodonisius Niaski, he's our XPS senior scientist. All other uh, technical contributors are also included here, including Boris England, Dr. Grobodira, Dr. Rajiv Soma, and Tina Hedderdurk. Uh, as you can see, there's so many people are contributing to this one. That's why this, uh, uh, with that hope, it is possible to cover this uh, uh, multi-scale assessment of the attitude manufacturing stocks. Today's webinar con uh, content will be covering multiple sections. First, we'll give a quick introduction to Eurofins EAG laboratories, and then we will go over what happens and what kind of defects could be introduced in the, in the attitude manufacturing process. And then, then, with that, we'll keep in mind how do we actually hope in the industry to access um, the powder qualities. Basically, we will break it down to three sessions. We'll look into the macro views from the composition to impurities, and we'll look in the micro scale of the surface features under the macro scale as well, because those are important and uh, represents a significant portion of the uh, powders. Now we'll go summary. Uh, why we wanted to have such a focus on the surface analysis, as we mentioned, compared to bulk materials, AM powders have 10,000 times more surface areas. And this uh, is a very active uh, fraction of material that can introduce in all possible defects. So they need to be carefully uh, taken care of. So European EAG laboratory is a global uh, has global position. Uh, it has, uh, as a third party lab, it has more than 300 uh, skilled employees across 20 locations and serving over 4,000 clients in 50 countries. And uh, here we we'll take a quick look at UAG's combination of techniques and there's a, a, a point as spectroscopy, microscopic analytic resolution tools. Within the box, you are seeing the surface analysis tools, and without a box, you have the bulk analysis the imaging tools. Within the box, you also see in the x axis is represents a concentration range of which a technique can uh, detect and quantify. Also, on the x axis, is re represents a length scale of a sampling, and uh, this across uh, nine orders magnitude. Inside the box, you can see each technique also has different colors. For example, blue color represents elemental informations. And orange and uh, yellow color represents molecular or phase informations, and then the others are corresponding to the other physical properties. So with this, all this combination, 
Uh, EAGs techniques can be used uh, in serving a variety of industry from aerospace to semiconductor to medic, uh, uh, medical devices to energy storage as well as to manufacturing. So uh, civilization is driving by the actually the evolution of metallurgy. We started with Stone Age, Bronze Age, still to the Iron Age, we are still in that age. And our ancestors are very smart. They figured out how to make the metal parts. They use fire, force, and the forging process. Still today, we are using the same process. And it's a little bit more spot away. And uh, we're gonna use laser beam or electron beam to deliver the energy more precisely. We use metal powders to control the uh, compositions. And with that, we can build in parts. So why energy manufacturing is so appealing? because it can provide us on precedented level access to parts with geometry configuration complexity with a tight composition gradient control and the lightweight structure design makes uh, become a possibility as well but as everything else there is not a without problems now let's take a look at what can happen uh, in, in the additive manufacturing process additive manufacturing process uh, uh, what we are discussing here involve the e-beam or laser beam as an energy beam and will interacting with the powders metal powders here as this interaction happening going on it involves rather complex transient and physical thermophysical and chemical process if during this process defects arises and the microprocessor is one of the major uh type of defects they can be formed by the lack of fusion uh introduced by kill collapse gas porosity, boring, solidification, cracking, or sputtering, et cetera. And here I'll give you a quick example is in terms of how they look like. For example, here is a entrapped gas porosity. Um, they are spherical uh, with a diameter uh, diameters from a few microns, tens of microns. And then you have irregular shape of porosities, other you like seeing complete melting, or is a lack of fusion, as you can see, some of the particles are trapped in this cracks. And then you have really solidification cracks crossing multiple uh, hundreds of microns, even millimeters. So you can see those porosity are across multiple length scale from micrometers to millimeter size. So the question becomes which one is deeply related to the quality of the stuff? The answer is all of them. So Aside of microporosities, uh, other defects can also be introduced, in site, such as entrapped deleterious impurities. Uh, one of the main interests of additive manufacturing powders are super alloys. Here is uh, uh, the main composition. They are based on nickel, so nickel is a base alloy element. In order to have mechanical strength, they have the adding uh, all kinds of alloy elements for solution strengthening, precipitation strengthening, uh, grain boundary uh, binding strengthening. So with all that, uh, and then they also need the surface protection and corrosion resistance. That's why chromo is open as a, one of the major gradients. And then they have to improve the long-term stability. And so there's rare earth added as well, as well as other elements. With uh, so many elements added, inevitably, there are a lot of impurities added. And they do have a great impact on the mechanic strength of the final parts, as we're showing here. You can see those elements, they have low melting point or they are trichogenized uh, formation elements and they even at the ppm levels increase from a couple of ppm to tens of ppm you can see the mechanic performance such as ductility and the rupture back to rupture drop that can nearly by 30 25 percent to 50 percent so it is important to control those impurity levels in the alloy powders so here we we're going to take a multi-scale materials characterization approach because as you can see powders involve many uh, actually involves uh, many uh, chemistries and uh, length scales here we show you a typical titanium six aluminum for vanadium additive manufacturing powders that's SEM images in a single particle scale it is close to 20 30 microns so this is rather small but it also has some of those minor particles attached to it and this is a uh, Multi, multi particle scale um, this is you know 100 particle scale and this is tens of thousand particle scales as you can see 
it is important to understand not only the particle size distributions, as we shown here, it has two dimensional, two by model distributions, uh, but also it needs to understand the surface chemistries and the bulk compositions because ultimately those are the things that dictate the final mechanical property that you can achieve. So in EAG, we do take a multi-scale approach. Uh, here we will demonstrate to you, we are going to evaluate single particles to so tens of millions of particles. We're going to look at not only elemental information, we're also looking for the molecular or to phase information. We're not only looking for the bulk composition, we also need to understand surface, chem surface, prop surface uh, characteristics. We're not only looking for the composition elements, we also need to look for the impurities, as I mentioned. All of those are relevant to the additive manufacturing metal powder qualities. So here's how we're going to take the approach. We're going to break down two, three sections, but uh, our topic here today mostly, mostly dealing with the chemistry side. So we're dealing with bulk chemistries and surface chemistries. In the bulk chemistries, we're looking to the composition of the ore. The composition is really laid the foundation for the ultimate microprocess uh, microstructure uh, to the final mechanic properties. We need to look into impurities. As you can see, some impurities would directly impact the mechanical strength. Some are of biotoxicity concerns if they are using for biomedical device industry. Some are really like gas light elements or lighter elements impurities. They are one of the major source for gas porosity in the finishing parts. We also pay a great attention to the surface chemistry because the additive manufacturing powders has such a high surface volume of atoms so they do dictate or in a larger part uh, affects the melting behavior as well introducing all kinds of contaminants into the, uh, into the final part. So we were using XPS and fractional IGA to look at the surface bonding chemistry as well as uh, speciating different kinds of uh, elements such as oxides, interstitial oxygen or cell. We're gonna look into the oxide thickness uh, because for most uh, titanium alloys as uh, inca nails or super alloys that there is always a native uh, oxide on the surface on the powders and they have different melting behavior they are melting temperature they have different uh, hydrophilicities to moisture and other things so they have a great impact on the final parts on the, and then we also have to look in the surface contaminants is, because of such a large surface area that is so easy to prone to contaminants some are um, by the manufacturing process, some are actually by the handling and packaging or so. So uh, with all those, we'll go through those uh, today and share our experience with you and how do we attack those, issue, those issues and what kind of information actually can reveal. So first section will be the bulk analysis at the macro scale. So we are, when we're talking micro scale, we're talking about a gram level assessment of hundreds of milligrams to gram levels. This is actually equivalent to tens of millions to hundreds of millions of particles we are analyzing. So obviously they, they should at this level is, can easily achieve the representative sampling. For details of techniques we're discussing here, there's uh, individual technical webinars. You are encouraged to know more details of it. Here today, we are mostly just re uh, talking about some of uh, what kind of analytic information it can bring to us and how do we use it uh, properly. So in line with uh, uh, the energy manufacturing industry standardization efforts, ASTM and the ISO formed the working committee to develop additive manufacturing standards. Uh, here today, our topic will be focused primarily focused on feedstock materials. More specifically, we are focused on metal powders with titanium and nickel based alloy powders as example. Those are used for aerospace, medical, and automotive industries. Uh, EAG does have a separate seminar dealing with the polymer powders uh, under their application characterization. After that, we also have a seminar regarding finished parts. Uh, here, we're going to use titanium uh, alum alloy powder as our primary example to demonstrate how EAG approaching this uh, assessment of the quality of powders. So titanium powders does have uh, uh, ASTM standards to uh, define ASTM standards. For example, it has alloying elements, aluminum, vanadium, minimum content and maximum content, and also the major impurities such as iron, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and tritium. 
uh, the maximum uh, acceptable levels. Aside from there, that they also this standards also uh, specify the all other impurity content and the total impurity content of the alloys, as you can see here. So uh, how do we do this? Well, in UAG, we take a again uh, for this composition analysis, we take a, a macro scale approach. So for a satisfactory quality of AM powders, it needs to be high purity and with uniform composition. And so meaning that uh, there will be no density change. This is important because when during the additive manufacturing process, you don't want to change the thermal capacity of the material. You don't want a variation in the thermal conductance. So any of those will result on even melting and the solidification process. Any broadening of the composition can cause in the solidification temperature broadening as a result it tends to form cracks or micro velocities. So in terms of technical wise, we need a, the technique to be precise, to be accurate, and to be sensitive for elemental analysis. On top of it, it needs to be able to evaluate the powders uniformity in the micro scales, which means uh, typically 25 to 1.0 gram levels. This is equivalent to tens of million to hundreds of million particles. At this level, should be able to achieve the representative sampling. So the technical we use are three terms. One is ICP OES, the second is ICP MS, and then the IJ technical which actually break down into three. So ICP OES, ICP M are solution sampling. It can determine the metal contents or metal alloys contents at the PPM percentage levels. An IJ technique specific dealing with the light elements or gas forming elements like the oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon sulfurs. And uh, for those technical to be um, to be really good, you need to uh, control the sampling process. Uh, we need to measure to qualify the method so to achieve the necessary precision and accuracy. Uh, as a result of the EAG participating in the interlaboratory studies. That organized by LGC for new manufacturing powders. Uh, here shows the example. One other example is Type 64 powders, and here shows the uh, you know key alloying elements as well as those uh, uh, trace impurities. And um, you know, using ICP OES, ICPMS as IG technique. Here's our measured value against the certified value. As you can see, this shows that the you know, uh, that uh, uh, EAG's method is really uh, very accurate and sensitive and uh, precise. And this is important uh, and enable us to be able to provide production support and or R&D support for our clients to give them the accurate and precise results for the product that they are developing. So uh, aside from uh, the composition analysis, one of the key uh, aspects is impurity analysis. As we mentioned early on, um, that impurity is an important source for defects. So ideally for any AM powers, it would be desirable to have full survey capability and a high sensitivity detection at the macro scales. Two techniques are available there is one is ICP quadruple mass spec, which as mentioned early on, and you can have ability to determine metals and metal alloys uh, impurity levels with the detection limits, one to 10 ppm levels depend on the elements. Uh, there is a, another technique uh, which is uh, uh, use, uh, is a very powerful for the aerospace, semiconductor industry, and energy storage industry is a high resolution uh, glow discharge mass bag. Uh, it has more uh, elemental, more broad elemental coverage. Uh, it includes non-metal such as halides, sulfur, all those things, at the lower detection limits. Here's a couple of main features of GDMS. It is using actually argon plasma to do direct solid sampling. And it can survey up to 74 elements in the periodic table, including halides. And we know that it is halides often causing the corrosion resistance weakening. And it is very sensitive to key impurities with long, excellent long-term precision. Here I give you an example. Those, for example, in the silver alloys, there are a tight spec requirement for the impurity, in particular, those low melting point uh, metals, as we shown here. Uh, also, the charcoal elements, which is known to form metal charcoal which are 
either is uh, um, two-dimensional material which is uh, lubricating so it can weaken in the uh, green boundaries uh, or so so this is typical on the left -hand corner are the typical specification maximum you can see it's only a few pb or tens of pbm on the right hand is uh, the right corner is the current low reporting limits for example some of them are 0 0.1 0 0.2 and 0.5 ppm so it requires a uh, technical which is very sensitive to uh, reporting detecting those elements as we shown here we have the pdms uh, uh, capability can easily exceed those reporting limits requirement so how gdms uh, uh well gdms is sensitivity gdms actually is an excellent long-term production support tool for qualifying reportifying and repurposing air metal powder feed stocks the reason for that is uh, one of the main uh, measurement of um, manufacturing uncertainty arising from the AM powder is the impurity or the cleanness of the powders. And this is a factor that is open subject to variation and contamination is unpredictable. So how do we do that? Here, give you an example. We're using element GD. It's one type of GDMS instrument. We can look at uh, the reference materials and then we do day in and day out of monitoring. This is a uh, standard, we run 200 uh, over a year. This is 200 working days. You can see those are certified value trace elements and this is actually the readings over their one year span. You can see the ISD is less than 10%. This clear to demonstrate, this is a great tool for long-term production support uh, for qualifying the purities or cleanness of those metal powders. So, Aside from the composition analysis, as we mentioned, we need to look at the surface analysis in both macro scale and micro scale. Uh, the reason for that is those particles are so small, the surface volume represents a significant portion of it. Uh, as a result of that, we did a, a, some rough mathematical estimations. It turns out the oxide volume fraction uh, is about is a linear, uh, proportional to the thickness of the oxide film. And there is the inverse proportion of the particle diameters. And uh, here, I give you a quick graphic uh, slice of the presentation. This plot shows the oxide film thickness, uh, the oxide volume fraction uh, versus the oxide film thickness. As you can see, the increase is linearly. On the other side, the oxide volume fraction will increase pro uh, inverse proportion with particle diameters. For the additive manufacturing powders, they are typically in this range. As you can see here, so the AM powder can have up to 1% volume surface oxide. This is significant, and that they are important. As Dr. Wolfgang Pauli said, while God made the bulk, the surface was truly invented by the devils. On this surface, there are all kinds of functional group, oxygen vacancy, cation vacancies, amorphous oxides, all those things, they are so active, they are one of the major source contributing to the defect. So they need to be properly examined and quantified. Here it shows the glance or table to see how what kind of techniques need to be used. So automatically we want to have a satisfactory quality of AM powder, which has a contamination free surface. And now we also want the chemistry to be uniform on the surface. So obviously we need a surface sensitive analysis tools and we wanted to be able to analyzing on a single particle level and multiple particle level and tens of millions of particle level levels. So the four techniques EAG have uh, readily used can be used for this service or uh, to satisfy those needs are TOPSIMS, OJ, XPS, fraction or IG analysis. TOPSIMS uh, is truly a uh, surface sensitive technique. It uh, collect information on the first few atomic layers and is most effective for surface organic in the organic contaminants. OJ is another surface sensitive technique. Unlike top sims, it can go a little deeper and then mostly powerful effective information collected from there, including surface oxide thickness, depth of profiling, and surface contaminants as well. You know, and those two techniques you can see it is really sampling a single particle to tens of particles. On the macro scale, we have two techniques. XPS and fraction IGA. XPS is another truly surface sensitive technique. Uh, um, in addition to providing contamination information, it's really one of the most powerful tools to provide you bonding chemistries. Uh, 
uh, for fractional IG, it is not dealing with the, uh, is most specific dealing with the uh, light elements such as oxygen, nitrogen, hence this technique is uh, very useful in determining the surface bulk, oxygen, nitrogen, moisture content, residual OH, that's at PBM levels. So we'll go over a little bit more details of this one. First, is micro scale surface analysis with top sims and the OJ spectroscopy, uh, electron spectroscopy. But details of the techniques, we, uh, we encourage you to go to those specific webinars, which is easily available on EAG's website. So how top sims works? Here shows the top sims basic principles. Top sims is a mass bag. Is actually a secondary ion mass spec, and they use in top to resolve the mass uh, uh, differences. So you use we using a pulse primary ion beam. This is very gentle ion beam energy. It's only a few electron volts. With that energy, it is sufficient to dissolve molecules from the surface, but it's also low enough to preserve the molecular information. And each mass have different velocity and they come to the detector different time, hence the time of flight. With that, we can provide uh, um, a full mass spec information. Each pulse of the primary ions can produce a full mass spec of secondary ions. Top sims operate in two modes, the positive ion mode and the negative pi ion mode. Here shows you the positive ion mode and that it is very effective in detecting organics, such as solids, surfactants, low level of metals and some of them are fossil oxide. As you can see here, the first one is TI64. We can look at the contamination, identify the contamination that late, and also other organic species and including those inorganic low level you know, uh, metals content here. On the uh, night nose, you can see there is a duct of the surfactants and, and, and a few other metal impurities as well. And on the aluminum, the surface is rather clean and there's not really a lot of organic contamination, rather it features the amorphous oxide hydroxy group on the aluminum surfaces. So aside from positive ion mode, TOPS is capable of negative ion mode. Here it shows you the different contamination on the surface. For example, uh, TI64, we're looking a lot of uh, halogen compounds and nitrate sulfates, phosphates. And on the aluminum, is, again, is mostly surface hydroxide or most oxides or so. So this top seems is very powerful to tell us what kind of contaminations on the surface and uh, what happened in your packaging or, or handling. And this is, uh, uh, as you can see, all those do have a, a certain potential to introducing defects to the final parts. For example, those things are known to cause corrosion resistance uh, uh, reduction. And so are those things, and those are known to, you know, forming moistures and uh, hydrogen wind reacts with aluminum, hence the gas porosity is the finishing parts. Top seems is not only be able to detect the organic and inorganic contaminants, it also enables particle to particle distribution analysis on the first top nanometer layers. Here it shows you the aluminum mapping, ion image mapping, titanium mapping, and the contaminants copper mappings. We can also plot it and see the actual particle to particle variations. Here, the numbers are normalized to aluminum, so aluminum signal is 100. You can see from particles to particles, there is a distribution of titanium, vanadium, and the contaminants, including the inorganic contaminants and organic contaminants. So it really give us a, a direct visualization on the particle to particle level, how the contamination is changing from particles to particles. OJ presence on other surface of sensitive techniques. As I mentioned, it's a, it's a very powerful technique for characterizing the surface oxide and the compositions. So how OJ works? OJ is the electron beam technology. So obviously you're gonna use an electron beam to irradiate your sample or atoms. And some electrons will be elastically scattered away. Some will hit a nucleus and bounce back. So hence the back scattered electron. Some electrons will knock out inner shell electrons, releasing secondary electron emittance. Uh, once this in, uh, inner shell electron is kicked out, the ions are very excited and they need to be relaxed. And there are two ways for them to relax the background. One is releasing the X-ray fluorescence 
by falling back in the inner shell, uh, the electron will fall back from the outer shell to the inner, inner shell. As you can see, this energy is characteristic to elements, as XR is a, a common technique used for comp elemental composition analysis. Another relaxation process is what we are primarily interested here today, is the inner shell, outer shell electron falling inside into the inner shell, and it really kicks out the OG electrons uh, as a relaxation process. The kinetic energy of the OG electron is characteristic to element, and the OG electron has a very short mean pass ways of a few nanometers, has only the surface, the first few nanometers depth, the OG electron information can be black, has OJ is indeed a very surface sensitive techniques. Another feature is the uh, electron beam used for OJ analysis tend to be very small. It could be less than 25 nanometer. So this made it a very ideal tool for analyzing single particles. As an example here, we can see those are titanium type 64 particles. And uh, here showing you uh, the, the bright spot inside of each particles in the red circle is actually OJ analytic size. And a typical OJ spectrum shows the plot of kinetic energy with the signals. And the signal is first derivative, so it is more sensitive to technical elements specifically assigned to it. In this survey mode, you can see we can see the typical elemental composition of a Ti64 element, Ti64 metals. You have titanium, you have oxygen, you have aluminum. Surprising, we don't see vanadium. So that shows us that vanadium is not really participating in the oxide formation of this uh, titanium alloy carbers. Uh, we do see copper and uh, clear carbon con carbon contamination. This is uh, consistently happening from particles to particles. So um, OJ is one of the most powerful feature of OJ analysis is actually is to acquire oxide depth profiling thickness nanometer resident composition gradient and a contaminant profile, all deeply related to defect formation process in the AM parts. Here I'll give you an example is particle one we analyzed. You can see there is uh, oxygen peaking in 230 angstroms or so and the tables off. Titanium is low at the beginning until it and then slowly coming, uh, reaching the bulk level at approximately 200 angstroms. And aluminum also slowly increasing. Surprising, we are not seeing vanadium at the beginning. That's what it confirmed that in the previous slides. We do see carbon contamination. We also see uh, carbon enrichment on the surface. And on the second particles, you can see the profile is slightly is quite a bit different. You have less carbon here, it's still there. Um, but oxygen profile is also different. Um, based on the, this oxygen profile, we can also determine the oxide thickness. Here is a half. Uh, up high of the maximum, which indicates it's about eight nanometer thickness, while this one is six nanometer thickness. So you can see from particle to particle, there is a variation in terms of oxide thickness, in terms of composition gradient, in terms of contamination levels. And this is important for us to have an atomic view of the quality of the part of the particles. Uh, aside from the micro, micro scale surface analysis, uh, we that give us the, you know the atomic resolution information on the surface. Uh, we also want to be able to assess in larger scales. XPS and fraction IG provide such opportunity for us. For details of XPS technique, we encourage you to go to our website and there is more detailed discussion in terms of XPS technique itself. It is widely used for many uh, applications. So how XPS work? XPS is an X-ray, uh, using X-ray uh, energy or light to irradiate sample, and it will eject the electrons. The, the X-ray, the, the penetration or inter interaction volumes, it can be down to several microns. But the OJ electron, or uh, the photoelectrons, only escape from the first 100 angstroms or less. And this photoelectrons has a characteristic of kinetic energy and binding energy. Uh, when it is uh, when it is ejected out from the samples, its binding energy is a function of uh, excitation X-ray energy, electron spectrum metabolic functions, and mass of charges. But the binding energy itself is characteristic not only to the element, but to its valence state. state. Hence, XPS can be used is one of the most powerful tool 
to provide inbounding chemistries on the surface. Here I give you a typical surface spectrum of XPS. Here the X axis represents the binding energy, Y axis a signal intensity. The binding energy is specific to the element and to its weighting state. And with that, uh, we can actually look in the surface chemistries. And uh, another context of this information is that uh, the spectrum is collected with over analytical area of 1.5 millimeter to uh, times 0.6 millimeter. So it has a current 10, seven to eight particles. So you should uh, look at the sample in the macro view and uh, it is on the survey analysis mode. So there's no spiraling and this information actually from the first five nanometers. And here gives you uh, quantitative assessment on the surface elements information. As you can see, uh, we expected to see the oxygen, aluminum, titanium, and uh, we confirm what the top seams and uh, OJ seam. Uh, there is very few, uh, very disproportionate small amount of vanadium on the surface. But aside from this, you can see the surface is full contaminated, it's so contaminated with the other elements. The carbon content is what we see in the top, and what we see in the OJ as well, you can see all those other low melting point impurities in there in some percentage, percentage level. So you can see OJ is pretty powerful, like a, a top, oh, the so XPS is pretty powerful, uh, equally powerful as OJ or, or top seams, but it provides a more micro scale view of the surface contaminants it looks like. As we said, uh, uh, what's unique to XPS is providing bonding chemistries. So here is the surface chemistry of the uh, titanium uh, additive manufacturing powders. This is aluminum chemistry. As you can see, there is you no know, really just single peak and it's assigned to aluminum oxide. Um, this, remember, this is information comes from the first five nanometer surface. It's truly the surface scale, oxide scale. Unlike aluminum, titanium does show several chemistries. It turns out that there are about 90% of titanium oxide uh, in the form of titanium oxide, about 5% as titanium nitride, and 6% as actually metallic titanium. So what this tells us? Well, it tells us that the oxide scale composition is truly mostly titanium aluminum made. And about 90% of the powder surface are uh, with the titanium oxide layers over 5 millimeter six, uh, thick. But there is a few percent is less than that. Hence, we can see the titanium mount, uh, metals. And there are also a few percent uh, on the scale has actually titanium nitride. And uh, aluminum, there is no matter. Aluminum is all uh, in this final name, Mr. Cell, is aluminum oxide. So this gives us an idea, also give us another insight as to what is to be expected when melting those uh, during the additive manufacturing. As those titanium oxide, titanium nitride, and titanium itself have different melting points. They may be introducing defects in different uh, way to the finished parts. On top of it, we can see it because this changes in the surface chemistry, it can actually introduce different uh, polar group on the surface, and the ability to absorb moisture is on uh, the subside jobs, so, which is one of the main, main source of gas velocity as well. So here then we come to the way, how do we assess this surface, you know, moisture content? How do we assess in the residual hydroxyl group? Because once those are there, they can tend to absorb moisture and change the, uh, the flowability, also the aggregation behaviors. And uh, on top of it, it can contribute to the gas velocity in the finishing part or hydrogen embrittlement or lower the strength, ductility, and equipped resistance at high temperatures. And all those uh, elements, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, to present in multiple forms. You know, they can be on the surface, as we see a lot, larger portion of this oxide. Oxygen could be on the surface as oxide scales. But doesn't mean there is no oxygen dissolved in the bulk. So it is important to understand surface oxygen content in the versus bulk of oxygen content. After all, some of the surface oxygen might be removed, but the bulk is, is less likely. And uh, you know, it's also important to understand whether it's on interstitials, uh, oxygen, or precipitate oxides. Are they in an ionic form, or they are covalent like hydroxyl group or cell, or they are volatile, non-volatile? So, with a fractional IG analysis, there is a chance we can separate those things. So, how fractional IG works? 
Fractional IG works starting with a fresh kidney mold. We hit the sample instantaneous over 2,000 degrees. So all the oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen will be released and detected. And so either CO2, nitrogen diatom, or hydrogen diatom. Next, we will do a ramping mode. We'll start with heating the sample up. Then all those so oxygen, so those uh, that element chemistry depends on their thermal stability or their reaction with the uh, with the graphite crucibles, it will be released at different temperatures. As you can see, you are seeing uh, several peaks. And uh, with a static heating mode, we can fine tune in the heating release profile or the parts of those peaks and hence be able to quantify each individual peaks. Now, one of the main uh, applications of this fractional analysis is to actually determine moisture residual hydroxyl group content in even PBM levels. And this is not a technical easily, um, this kind of information is not easily achievable by any other techniques. And um, more importantly, we can assess this at not on a single particle level, we can assess it in the macro particle levels or tens of millions of particles. How do we do that? We look at the temperature program desorption, behavior of moisture hydrogen, uh, typical aluminum powders. You can see based on that, the high moisture most released it was 370 or so. Of that, there is a moisture reaction with aluminum from hydrogen. So based on those information, we design our program, a ramping program. And here, the ability to use and have a fraction IG and not to quantify moisture residual content is based on the fact that the oxygen in this technique is, is always detected as CO, CO2, and hydrogen is detected as hydrogen dioxide. So in a fresh heating mode, all of those species will be called converted uh, fully to CO, CO2 or hydrogen, and that's all be detected. But then in the ramping mode, um, only the bulk oxygen hydrogen will be detected at high temperature. While moisture and the residual, residual hydroxyl group, they will be eliminated as water at low temperature, and they'll not be detected. The difference is then between the fresh heating mode and the ramping mode are considered as the moisture in the hydroxyl group. As we're shown here, in the fresh heating mode, three replicas, we get the total oxygen number and hydrogen numbers. And then you can see the technique is reproduced very well, so it has great precision. And then in the ramping mode, again, we do ramping, and we also get a very reproducible results. And the differences is 200 ppm oxygen, 20 ppm hydrogen, which is the ratio is 10 to 1, it's approximately the uh, uh, the water content. So with this technique, you can see we can quantitatively assessing trace amount moisture hydroxyl group on the powder samples. And we do know this is a pretty good way to see how the powders how to control the powder of uh, probabilities and uh, other aggregation patterns. So with those information, it will help uh, you to assessing the surface chemistry in a rather quantitative ways. Another important uh, uh, feature for fractional oxygen analysis is uh, to look at the oxygen chemistry. As you can see, there is such a high surface area of oxide, a uh, high surface area of the uh, aging manufacturing powder, and the surface is fully uh, covered with oxide. So with the fraction method, when we heat it below melting point, we are really just dealing with the surface oxygen. And when we heat it well about titanium alloy point, we are allowing the oxygen inside the bulk to be released, and here it shows you the, and each of them can be quantitatively analyzed. And this is a lot of A and this is a lot of P. So fraction analysis enables us to, in a quantitative way, to assess the surface oxygen content with the bulk of the oxygen content. It has another important meaning is that uh, some of the oxides, for example, the in canal cell, it be the surface of foam or molly, and it can cause the evaporation of metals as well. So Knowing those information not only is able to, you know, uh, to, to control the body, but actually uh, on a molecular level, atomic level, to troubleshooting uh, the issues. Overall, here is uh, when it comes to the end of the lecture, is that uh, you know the end powder we're really focusing here is how to weigh body uh, analyzing the quality of the AM powders. And it not only is been qualification, but how it requalification or recycling the powders, if it comes to that, or whether we can fail or repurpose for other applications. In all the site, in the entire life cycles. 
So the raw material that goes into it, what is the product safety in the product safety assessment level, in the R&D level, in the production, manufacturing powders, on the handling, shipping, and qualifying it, or when it fails. So the tools we're using in the summary here, we look at the bulk chemistry in the macro scale. We can surface chemistry in both macro and subscales and the other aspects. So why you choose your fancy EAG laboratories? Find confidentiality is core to our business. We are established thought leaders in investigative science, and we have extensive knowledge base and scale expertise. As you can, as we demonstrate here, we often offer a multidisciplinary approach to support the industries. We can scale with your demand. We have uh, um, a lot of instruments, we have redundant instruments, so that uh, as need that we can always pull those capacities up to support it. We have more than 25 instruments globally. We are a global leader for material testing services. We support ISO 9001, ISO 1724 qualification. In short, we are here to help you solve, solve your problems and uh, in terms of materials and in terms of engineering. Uh, and here are the, some of the future webinars uh, you can check into. Um, upcoming live webinar will be added to our schedule soon. Please check back with us.